Throughout the swinging 60s, young British filmmaker Michael Winner proved his worth on the British independent film scene. Making youth culture movies such as Play It Cool, starring musician Billy Fury, Let's go. and The System, one of the films that would go on to make a young Oliver Reed into a star. Using his charm and his wits, as well as his production skills, often editing his own movies under the name Arnold Crust, Michael Winner climbed his way up the filmmaking ladder. He became known as a man who could get his films made by any means necessary. By 1969 and 1970, when it had scored larger budgets and became known as a director who could handle stars like Orson Welles, Michael Crawford, and Ryan O'Neill. From 1971 to 1974, Michael Winner would go on to produce several films which would become cult classics. As a filmmaker, these films have always been very important to me. And through this work, I want to explore the themes of these films and perhaps why Michael Winner is often overlooked as one of the early 1970s great filmmakers. After the success of his first big action film, Hannibal Brooks, for United Artists in 1969, followed by the sports drama The Games in 1970, young English director Michael Winner was hot off the press and soon found himself discussing his next project for United Artists in Hollywood with the legendary Burt Lancaster. Securing the star for the lead was a condition of the studios in order for them to let a director like Winner, known for his comedies, direct a western. Winner flew to Los Angeles to meet the star and with the aid of his charm and his wit, managed to get Lancaster for the lead in Lawman. Lawman begins a creative and artistic flourish in Winner's career, which I feel he never really bettered. Lawman is a bleak and uncompromising western, filled with high tension and drama, which asks us to question the moral values of our lead protagonist, which makes it stand alone as an unusually dark western for the period. He followed Lawman with the strange high tension sexual drama The Nightcomers, released by Avoco Embassy Pictures in 1971. The film starred Marlon Brando and was a prelude to the Jack Gold film, The Innocents, based on the novel, The Turn of the Screw. The film was described by Winner, in the dreaded words as he put it, an art film. He then began a long and lucrative relationship with actor Charles Bronson, beginning with the violent revenge Western Cato's Land, followed by the action film, The Mechanic. Now being well known for delivering projects on time and under budget, when it directed both of these projects for United Artists in 1972. In 73, when it worked with Lancaster once again, along with French New Wave star Alain Delon, in the Walter Murch produced espionage thriller Scorpio. An early entry into the slew of paranoia films that would be very big in the 1970s. when you kill me, Jean. That won't bother me. Not this time. This section in Winner's career came to a successful end with two action thrillers. The socially minded Stone Killer from Columbia in 1973, followed by perhaps Winner's best known film Death Wish from Paramount Pictures in 1974. Both of these films starred Charles Brunson hitting the height of his fame in the action genre. Now even with this list of successful and star-studded movies, I find that when I bring up Winner in conversation with other independent filmmakers, 
he is often overlooked as a powerhouse director, and I've never really understood this. To create several well-received films, such as a case of these, over a few years, really is an outstanding achievement. After his death in 2013, I remember reading the obituaries in the papers and being surprised people seemed to be dismissing his film work. Instead, they were only talking about Michael Winner, the flamboyant and politically outspoken socialite. Although he was always remembered in a pleasant and heartfelt way, only the Death Wish franchise was really mentioned. No one seemed to be remembering a filmmaker who had a string of hits and was often applauded by the critics of his day for creating some very thought-provoking good entertainment. I believe he really had something to say with these several films he made in the early 1970s. Throughout these films, when it creates a downbeat and uneasy feeling, there is a brooding menace lurking in the background of each character, and there is definitely a social commentary running throughout them. Sometimes the only difference between a lawman and a killer is which side of the badge he's on. Bert Lancaster is the lawman. Winner was interested in telling stories for entertainment, as well as having a theme and a social commentary. I genuinely believe he was creating content reflecting the public consciousness, and that first and foremost, he was interested in the human condition and creating good dramas. Winner has often been criticized for the violent and sexually explicit content of his films. In the 1970s, Winner's old Cambridge schoolmate James Furman was head of the British Film Board. Still, Winner often had problems getting his work passed uncut by the British censor. Winner himself has said that the violence in his films is there to create drama and tension. Winner was quoted as saying, Drama has always been about conflict. Shakespeare had people with severed heads, running around the stage with heads on poles. Do you think there was a Mary Whitehouse outside the globe? Regarding the drama and tension in Winner's films, Lawman in particular shocked me as an audience member. Not because of its violence, but because of its emotional ambiguity. In Lawman there begins a distraught feeling of emotional detachment. This seems to run throughout the characters in all Winner's American films. Lancaster's character is almost totally emotionless. He uses his laws, which he has sworn to defend as a barrier between himself and all other emotion and feeling. You hold the law too high. You always did. Without the rules, you're nothing. Are we going to stand around and wait while this killer chokes down whoever he wants in our town? He's a lawman. You want the law, but you want it to walk quiet. You don't want it to put a hole in your pocket. The law is his judge, jury, and executioner and he will follow it to the point of destroying all other meaning in his life. This is a character trait, which makes it very difficult to look at Lancaster's portrayal as the normal Western genre hero. This is where I begin to feel Winner is seeing something very interesting with his characters. It seems the lawman will go through his whole life destroying everything so he doesn't have to deal with his emotions at all. Anything that touches him or makes him feel uncomfortable is unacceptable. Our hero is imperfect and untrustworthy, but he is still there to defend us from evil. He is our own system of law come back to haunt us. He is upholding our laws, whether we like it or not. There's been enough. He's calling. He killed Harvey. You can't let him go. Maddox! 
It's over, Jace. I don't crawl. He'll kill you. Your hands off of me. I'm not afraid of him. I'll be a walk fire for you. He's my son, Maddox. Don't beg him! The Law Man is the first hint at a running social commentary throughout these films. There is a system in which we all live, and whether we like it or not, we are forced to live by it. Or are we? Winner's next production, The Nightcomers, carries on that idea that people can become trapped by their own beliefs and indeed be destroyed by them. Marlon Brando's character of Quint is an overbearing, brooding and sexually charged man who imposes himself and his beliefs onto others. Quint believes that to love is also to hate and that only death can be the ultimate joining of two souls. Had I but known, <laughs> in the beginning... More bullshit. Oh, you love as you find you can, love. And that's all. But all that pain... All the hurt... The dirtiness of it, Quint. Well, what did you think when we started? It was to be kind. It was to be gentle. Do you believe it's not a pain when you're born? Or it's... it's not so when you die? Do you think there's... there's no hurt when you love? Then you're a hypocrite. These beliefs? His overbearing eroticism and magnetism are what will eventually come to destroy him. This is the same belief system that locks away the emotions of Lancaster's character in The Lawman. Both these characters are using their belief in a system or a set of values to hide and separate themselves from others. In Quint's case, he uses his strong and natural demeanor to overpower and control people, so he is never vulnerable. This backfires on him in the end. This is the same way the lawman is controlling his world via a system of rules, which he never even invented. Both characters are using all they have to defend themselves from any emotional detachment. They are attempting to totally control their environment, which in Winner's films can only lead to one thing, explosive violence and self-destruction. In his next two films, Cato's Land and the Mechanic, Winner creates an untrusting and very violent world. There are no apologies for the violence in these films. At this time in the 1970s, the first televised war was shown constantly in the media, and violence was very much in the public consciousness. As Lawman was a comment on our laws and how we can be trapped by them, Cato's land literally holds up a mirror to what is happening in the world and imitates it. Cato's land can be taken as an allegory for the Vietnam War, and this was rightly picked up on by both English and American critics at the time of its release. Norman McLean Stoop, the critic for the New Yorker After Dark said, Cato's land is an unusually satisfying western. The parallel to Vietnam 
is almost impossible to ignore. Obviously, Winner was seeing something that people picked up on, and not just creating a violent throwaway exploitation film. The story of Cato's land follows a half-breed Native American played by Charles Bronson, who because of racial discrimination is forced to kill a man. Cato's home and family are taken away by a posse to be used as bait to catch him. He defends himself using his knowledge of his native land and fights in defense of his life and family. Cato is an excellent fighter and using cunning to outwit his cowboy posse pursuers, he fights with a calmness that suggests that violence comes very natural to him. Us down one after one. You can't find what you can't see. Just letting you know he's out there. This character trait is carried across to Bishop, the character played by Bronson in when his next film made that same year, The Mechanic. It is now we begin to see many running themes through Winner's characters and narratives. These four films all share a vision of the world which is dark and menacing. They look upon our systems and our ways of life. Lawman attacks our laws. The Nightcomers attacks our frailty and emotional vulnerability as humans. Cato's Land asks us to look at how we treat each other racially and how we wage war against each other. And the mechanic is about to show us a character who thrives upon all this violence. To me, there is no hidden message here. Winner is literally picking apart society piece by piece and giving us his views of what is going on in the world through his characters and their dramas. In The Mechanic, the protagonist is Bishop, a career-minded hitman who is interested in one thing, survival. Bishop has used the violence in the world to make a pretty nice home for himself. He owns a plush pad, complete with classical music and artworks, which he enjoys while calmly planning out his murders. Suggesting like Cato, in Cato's land, he is literally at home with violence. You're pressing pretty hard, you better be damn sure you want to know. This is not freshman philosophy time, I'm sure. You ever heard the term mechanic used outside of its normal meaning? Yeah. Where? My father used it. It's a dealer. A guy who works games tables. Anything else? Sure. It's a shooter. A hitman. So? So there we are. And that's your action? Yeah, that figures. I'm telling you this, because there are times when I could use a backup. Wouldn't have to spread myself so thin. And you seem to have the aptitude. You do this for money? Money is paid, but that's not the motive. It has to do with standing outside of it all on your own. I'm gonna teach you all I can. After that, you can choose how you want it to go. You in? Do I have an alternative? There are alternatives to everything. Bishop's line about standing alone outside of it all could be misconstrued as just being the stereotypical action hero. 
but I don't think this is the case. One could make the argument that all of these heroes are just representations of the male ego. But to me, each one of them represents a different part of society. And in the mechanic, Bishop represents the universal soldier. A man who gets paid to operate outside of the rules. A man who thinks he is outside of the system, but who there would be no system without. As the soldier of fortune is an integral part of the falling apart of modern society. And when his film shows how destructive and terrifying this way of life can be. Murder is only killing without a license. And everybody kills. Exterminating the rats. Bishop shares this with the protagonists in Lawman and the Nightcomers. All these anti-heroes have adapted to survive in a violent world, their own ways, with their own system. They are people who are constantly on the defensive against all emotion and threats, and fight against anything that might rock the stability of their lives. They are lone heroes with their own codes of valor and survival. Traits which are all now, in no small part thanks to these films, standards in the modern western and action genres. Winner knew what he was doing when creating genre pieces too. He filled all his films, whether western, action, drama or espionage, with the traits of the genre. This guaranteed an audience, and I believe this is why his films were all commercially successful at the time. He was satisfying the audience by giving them what they wanted, whether this be gunfights, action, explosions, or fantastic actors. Yet underneath, he was seeing something special for the more watchful viewer. He was using the text of an action film, but using the subtext as a microscope to look at society and to look at human drama. The difference in Winner's films is that his heroes, or anti-heroes, are always vulnerable in some way, and have huge character flaws. Some of them kill without conscience, or force their dominance on others, while some, as Michael Winner himself put it when asked by Burt Lancaster, why would I shoot somebody in the back? And Winner replied, because your character's a total arsehole, Bert. All the lead protagonists that we're supposed to relate to in Lawman, the Mechanic and the Nightcomers are the bad guys. If these are the characters we relate to, does that make us the bad guys? Winner's next two films deal with similar character subjects and commentaries. In Scorpio, Lancaster plays a CIA operative, a dirty agent of espionage who is in charge of sensitive operations. This includes such foreign policies as assassinating presidents and starting coups. Lancaster's bosses turn against him when he decides to retire. He knows too much and can't be let go in case he decides to sell secrets or defect. Scorpio is a very paranoid film, as many were in the 1970s. Once again, Winner is pulling apart the body of society and the politic of it. In this film, the government are corrupt and fight against themselves in devious and terrible ways, always in the dark of parking garages and sewers. You took this contract because you wanted inside. You wanted my job. And you needed a McLeod to carry your sins for you. I was finished with you, Cross. I was going home tomorrow with her. She was my way out. I'm sorry about the girl. Truly sorry. But I had no part of her plans. She was a Czech courier and very good.
A lot of hard work went into collecting this. Go ahead, Scorpio. It should be easy. You'll be doing both of us a favor. And there's an outside chance they might let you live. Two for one. This was winners go at the government system and how it handles the world and its affairs. I feel Scorpio was a very underrated paranoia film from the early 70s. It handles itself very well and has a sullen yet darkly comic performance from Lancaster. Scorpio is one of the only films to ever be allowed to film inside the CIA headquarters. This might give you an idea of how much pull and respect Winner had at this time of his career. So far in the 1970s, Winner has dealt with our systems of law, war, government, self-control, and profiteers of the violent world. Winner's next film is to deal with the violence in the police force, racism, and the huge class divides in early 1970s America. And I do believe that The Stone Killer is one of Winner's best films as an action director. There are some great scenes where the main character reflects on the violence he sees in the world, which are exceptional. One scene in particular has Bronson alone in his room looking in the mirror, and he genuinely looks afraid and at odds with himself. Lines from the lead protagonist like, a kid can buy a gun easier than a stick of bubble gum, show us a character who has sympathy for some of the criminals he is forced to prosecute. After killing a young man in self-defense, he is sorry for his actions, and tries to understand and analyze what happened when he says, they put it down like I don't care, a gun happy cop. I did try to talk him out of it, Helen. But I guess he wanted to be a comic book hero. Maybe he was just frightened, Lou. Yeah, he was scared. But he was dangerous, too. A kid like that, locked in the city streets, can't find his way over the respectable white wall. He's full of rage. He numbs the pain with junk. This way he made the newspapers. These lines once again reiterate the winner had strong themes and messages that he wanted to get across in his work. He was telling us about the racism, the degradation, and falling apart of modern society. By dealing with a disillusioned cop at the center of it, trying to hold everything together with the law. The Stone Killer is almost a blues song about society and tells us how fragile and upside down life locked in the city can be. Hands against the wall. There is another great scene that gives us an interesting bridge between this and when his next film. While on a stakeout, the film's protagonist, police inspector Lou Torrey, says this to his partner. We're chest deep in water, screaming against the rushing tide. You know, last three weeks in New York City alone, there were 159 homicides, 3,000 criminal assaults, 6,000 robberies. You multiply that by Chicago, Boston, Philadelphia, Los Angeles. He then looks away at the criminals getting into their posh cars and continues. You remember that cartoon of an old Roman circus where all the lines are roaring and the page boy yells down the corridor? You've got five minutes, Christians. These words are chilling, coming from a police officer, threatening to take the law into his own hands. These words directly lead us to one his best known and most commercially successful film, Death Wish. Death Wish is a bleak, disturbing, and masterful piece of filmmaking. 
Winner finally brings his ideas out of the Old West, the past and the fantastic, and puts them right onto our doorstep. His commentary on society is now on the violence in the suburban day-to-day -day world. The protagonist Paul Kersey is not a character from a genre, or a person removed from reality, such as a hitman or a CIA operative. He is a modern, middle-class architect. This time, when he gives his character a family, a home, a run-of-the-mill Monday to Friday job, which he doesn't want to return to from his holidays, and most importantly, a conscience. Kersey is the sum of all the characters that preceded him in the earlier films. He is a fully fleshed out three-dimensional character. All the other characters were a blueprint for Kersey. This is one of the reasons why Death Wish is Winner's most successful film. It is almost like he was testing out his ideas until streamlining them down into Death Wish. Kersey's conscience gives him a relatable quality that we see in ourselves. This makes it so we understand his suffering and eventually his revenge. It is the first time in one of the 70s films that the lead character is one of us, the man at the bottom of the system upon which all the others are built to protect or destroy. The story follows Kersey after his wife and daughter are attacked by a gang of muggers. His wife is killed, and his daughter is left in a coma after her rape and torture. The law tells Kersey not to get his hopes up, as there is little to go on. Kersey spirals into despair, until the unexpected gift of an antique handgun gives him an attempt at revenge. The gun we see in Death Wish is important. It is a link to the more lawless times of the gunslingers. This points to a time when we could protect ourselves any way we deem fit, comparing the lawless streets of modern-day New York City to the Old West. There is also a very interesting comparison to Winner's earlier film, Lawman, here. When Kersey is at the firing range, learning how to fire his weapon, the poster for Lawman can be seen in the background. I'm going to take these men back with me or kill them where they stand. Perhaps this was just a filmmaker's ego, or is it showing us a link between the two movies and telling us there's a parallel between them? Is Winner using this parallel to tell us that? Kersey becomes a killer not out of choice, but in response to the world attacking him and forcing him to face the violence within himself. Standing up for our laws and protecting us, no matter what, and facing the same moral dilemma of being the last line of defense in a corrupt and unsafe society. Any chance of catching these men? There's a chance, sure. Just a chance. I'd be less than honest if I gave you more hope, Mr. Kersey. Call him a mad vigilante. Call him a hero. Either way, he's always on target. We want you to get out of New York. Kersey is the answer to all the other questions of violence in the previous films. He becomes the poster for a generation that needs to fight back. He does what we'd all like to do. He breaks through the repression of the system by taking the law into his own hands and expressing his own form of justice. This is one of the reasons why I look at these films as a collection and call Death Wish the final film. It is like all the other characters that preceded Kersey are trying to break free from the repression of their systems, but they cannot. In Death Wish, one of Winner's characters has some kind of an answer and a glimmer at hope. And although he becomes a killer, and in essence the bad guy, he is broken out of his system and had a realization and a breakthrough in his life, the point which all the other films had been leading up to. In the end, Kersey is like the rest of Winner's characters in that he learns to survive by his own terms in a savage world of muggers, rapists, robberies, and murder. In a time when crime was rampant, and New York was in the grip of a crime wave, 
Winner simply put what he saw in the streets into an art form and created a very successful and brave film. Death Wish is still talked about to this day and will be talked about for a long time to come. Throughout these films, Michael Winner commented on society in all its forms, from top to bottom, ending in 1974 with a film that showed us what society in its most terrifying forms can do to the average man. He had a view and a message uh, you better be damn sure you want to know. that he conveyed in these films by practicing his message again and again, until in 1974 with Death Wish, he nailed it. Shut up. Your southern manners are showing. He did what all great filmmakers do. He told us great stories with intense drama. His characters are corrupt and downbeat because the world is corrupt and downbeat. Nothing in these films was sugar-coated. It was right up in your face with a strong social comment and a message to back it. For these films alone, Winner deserves respect as a director and a great entertainer. For me, in these several films, when I held up a mirror to society and asked us the question, is this really the reflection that we want staring back at us? <laughs>